Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Firoz Manji from Daraja Press. Welcome to Organizing in the Time of COVID. Today, we're going to be looking at the way in which the impact of COVID-19 has had on African economies. Uh, and I'm really pleased to have, I think, one of the greatest thing thinkers we have on this question, uh, Riaz Tayob from South Africa. Riaz is a, is a trained lawyer um, and, and holds a, a BA and an LLM uh, in, uh, in law, of course. He's currently a researcher at Siatini, the uh, Southern and Eastern African Trade Institute in South Africa, which deals with international trade and development. Uh, Riaz was uh, the Africa representative to the Third World Network in Geneva and served as correspondent for the uh, South North Development Monitor, covering the UN institutions and the World uh, Trade Organization. Riaz currently works on services trade, including health, intellectual property, as well as industrialization. I first met uh, Riaz uh, many years ago when uh, he had just come back from the Cancun meeting where the African representatives all withdrew. And I think uh, Riaz was not a small player in that whole exercise. Uh, so a, a very warm welcome to you, Riaz. So nice to see you again. Uh, the last time we met, in fact, was in Dakar. Uh, so, so, but you are back in South Africa and have been fasting. And so I really appreciate your giving time. Uh, but I hope you had a good break of the fast. Thank you very much. Uh, good to meet you, Firoz. And as always, you are too kind. I think uh, we have a good uh, chemistry. So the thoughts we share are uh, always a pleasure. And it's good to be here. OK, so so Riaz, help us understand um, in, you know, what has been the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the, uh, the economies of African countries? Uh, Feroz, this is, um, there's variable um, impacts, but as well as common impacts. So um, countries that have imposed a lockdown have walked into the wall of budget constraints in that they cannot impose a lockdown without having um, imposing a lot of difficulty on people in terms of no access to money, no access to food, uh, being uh, staying in slums where people are cramped and social distancing is virtually impossible. Um, so those are the lockdown countries. But even on the economic side, there are challenges because what has happened is that commodity prices have collapsed some by 70 percent some by 30 percent exports have collapsed uh, so the whole uh, trade um, you know import and export capabilities have declined significantly um, and uh, so the oil price doesn't help that much if your currency drops and your exports drop then we also have the impact of, um, you know, the slowdown in domestic economic activity. Uh, and that basically is um, uh, causing serious problems in the sense that the OECD established that South Africa could lose up to 28% of its GDP just for uh, the lockdown in this quarter. Uh, so um, as we know, you know, economies are all about flows. You know, one person's income is another person's expense. Uh, and the impact has been disastrous. In addition, because we have poorly developed social um, social safety nets, um, the cost of the lockdowns or the cost of social distancing has been met by the ordinary people the worst. And um, this is in a context where, you know, no one is okay unless everybody is okay, as Singapore discovered. You know, they looked after the citizens, but kind of didn't take care of the migrants. And then after lifting the lockdown, they had to go back into a lockdown. So what we are facing is nothing short of catastrophic. I think its impact will be greater than the um, global financial crisis of 2008. And, um, 
Yeah, it's uh, African countries face very difficult choices. Do you kill the virus or do you let people starve? Um, I know it sounds like a truism now uh, because it's been said so much, but um, you know what doesn't accompany that um, observation is that the rich countries have been playing it as business as usual. And there's been very little relief, even though there has been relief offered. Uh, this just shows the dependence of developing countries on uh, the developed world. And economically, this is going to be a disaster. I think the gains that we've made uh, however slight and uh, unequal are going to be wiped out uh, very quickly. So, 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 uh, so why are our economies so vulnerable uh, to the situation? Uh, I mean, clearly all, all economies have been affected in some way, but are there particular ways that, that Africa uh, makes itself vulnerable uh, to, to changes in price of uh, commodities of oil and so on um, yes there are uh, there are a lot of reasons I mean dependency theory is well developed discourse uh, but for example you have some countries that rely on one, one or two commodities for their exports so you have high degrees of specialization into uh, one or two commodities or even a basket of commodities and that makes you an international price taker. And part of the reason for this is because of the push towards globalization, the establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1995, the breakdown of special relationships between countries with the fall of the um, Berlin Wall and you know uh, the end of the Cold War, even though it was a hot war for us. Uh, so you have specialization in one or two commodities or few commodities that expose you to um, the commodity market uh, prices. You have low levels of manufacturing, and this is a direct result of uh, globalization. That is the view that we should import uh, goods that are cheaper than we can produce them locally. And what this has meant is that inefficient producers in our region have been wiped out because the protections they enjoyed immediately in the post-colonial period have been wiped out. So we import even things like toothpicks, gloves, masks, stuff that we could produce, but it's cheaper to import. So the globalization and the World Trade Organization and free trade area agreements have reduced tariffs, have basically reduced the uh, ability of the state to protect local producers and consequently we're import dependent and this import dependency is um, forces us to sell products that give us hard currency and this would be commodities so rich countries or countries that have a better fiscal room or better uh, distribution uh, generally produce manufactured goods because when you uh, increase uh, specialization or you increase output in manufactured goods costs go down uh, whereas in agriculture and mining the more you produce after a certain point costs go up so what you're doing is you're exchanging uh, you know products that keep increasing in uh, costs of production for products whose, whose prices go down. Uh, so that puts you into a vicious circle that, uh, of specializing in um, you know, um, diminishing return goods, that is mining and agriculture. Uh, and uh, this situation is actually complicated by the fact that because you can actually export something, there is demand for your currency. And because there is demand for your currency, your currency is set at the level of your raw material exports. Uh, and the link here is that your currency would therefore be overvalued for manufactured goods. If you look at the Asian countries and China, they somehow maintain low um, currency values so that they can export at a stable price and at a cheap price. Whereas relative to our productive capacity, African countries' currencies are overvalued relative to productive capacity. It's very strictly. So even if we go into manufacturing, we're uncompetitive, meaning that our producers need protection. 
So if you look at a country like Nigeria, it's been trying to get manufacturing off the ground for ages, but it can't because it's got oil. Its currency is too high, so it's cheaper for it to import. But it's only cheaper for it to import because globalization says don't protect your producers. It's very simple. All countries protected their producers before they became rich or before they became uh, middle income. And African countries have short-circuited that process by liberalizing. So we, um, we have a, a real problem uh, in, you know, on the production side, the real economy side. But the real problem comes in with our debt. African countries pay a lot of uh, money on uh, a lot of their budget on uh, servicing debt. They pay high interest rates on their debt. And cumulatively, they owe, owe over 300 billion. But they've been owning, owing, owing this for ages. And um, so when a country uh, gets a crisis like now and it wants to actually spend money uh, to save people uh, you know, from hunger or to invest in the health system uh, against the virus, uh, by spending money or printing money, it will basically uh, cause its currency to decline. And once its currency declines, its debt service costs, that means the dollars it has to get uh, you know, with its currency and pay back uh, increase. So it's a, a rock and a hard place with a kick in the face. But you were, you're saying the, that African economies have had this, this huge debt uh, for a long time. So in other words, this problem precedes the, the COVID crisis. Uh, yes, it does. But now it's going to get even worse. So, so Angtad is talking. Uh, yes, go on. Go on. Angtad, you were saying. Yeah. So Angtad is talking about uh, having debt relief for African countries, calling for a debt standstill as well as uh, suspension of interest payments. They're actually calling for basically a bankruptcy court or. Um, an international mechanism where debt can be restructured and written off without imposing costs on the country uh, that normally come with um, uh, structural adjustment programs. What they're saying is, is that we need a fair balance uh, between burden sharing between the debtors and creditors um, so that debt can be written off and restructured and also resources freed up so that countries can actually respond to the crisis. So, for example, by having enough money to pay for food so that lockdowns are effective so that the virus can be killed. Um, so this is a very radical proposal because if you remember, it took about 10 years of concerts and protests and you know rock stars coming just to get a few countries um, debt relief in 1996 under the highly indebted poor countries initiative. But because of globalization and everything, those countries are now uh, just as indebted or even more so than they were uh, in 1996, so this is a structural problem that needs a situation uh, that needs a solution. And I think the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has pushed um, a very good line. And I think developing countries all over should club together and support this, uh, because if they don't, the situation is going to be very dire. Because you're going to get hit by um, economic collapse as well as uh, the impact of the virus. So, so. Um, what's the likelihood of, I mean, we can have these recommendations, but what's the likelihood of actually debt being written off? Um, there have been some minor initiatives from the IMF, like something like, uh, you know, half a billion being made available as well as 14 billion by the World Bank. Uh, but these are just debt initiatives, right? So there is something being done. The G20 has called for a suspension of uh, principal as well as interest repayments from um, May till the end of the year and then a resumption. Now, um, this is simply not enough. I mean, in terms of scale, what UNCTAD is projecting is that developing countries will need uh, real resources in the order of 1.5 trillion uh, US dollars. So we're getting a pittance now. And um, a lot of it is not as conditional 
as uh, was uh, other loans from the IMF. But the real problem is, is that a lot of the debt that African countries owe now is um, owed, uh, you know, private sector to private sector. So um, the debt is actually, um, you know, uh, covered by uh, other covenants besides just bonds. So you need to get the participation of you know the bond holders and a lot of the debt does get sold to vulture funds who buy up the debt and then impose a lot of conditions on countries um, impose a lot of conditions on countries you know for meeting the payments but they're basically vulture uh, funds so um, the issue is do we have a default in a series you know where countries get under stress and then you know every once in a while a country is going bankrupt or do we actually collectively come together and say look what is the long term situation that we can um, actually get together and solve the problem so to answer your question basically there is very limited um, initiatives to provide relief to developing countries. It is business as usual and the rich countries basically seem to be using this as an excuse to tighten the noose on developing countries. Is there any potential, do you think, of uh, a movement to say, you know, this is your casino, you made a, made a bet and you're now losing out? we're not paying the Sankara line of saying, this is not our debt. We will not, we will refuse to pay it. What do you think there is potential? For uh, oh, there's always potential, but that potential is a function of power rather than reason. Okay. <laughs> um, the definitions of debt sustainability have been uh, shown to be, um, uh, unsustainable and they just keep changing the debts as Yash Tandon says you know sustainable debt in Africa is like keeping someone you know alive with food just so that it's just short of them falling dead you know uh, and that's the situation we've kept on uh, you know just a lifeline of just enough so um, the, 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 the real challenge comes with developing countries standing together collectively uh, as well as, um, you know, maybe the prospects of some relief coming through if there's, uh, you know, a series of crises that just keep on happening. Argentina is crashing, um, you know, Iran is crashing, you know, so is Venezuela, but these countries are resilient in their own ways. Um, but if it starts happening on a mass scale, maybe that, then there will be reason to um, take action. But I do think that there is a strong push uh, from countries like China who have basically pushed the um, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism at UNCTAD, at the South Center, at the UN. And now um, the woman who drive that, drove that, Yu Fen Li, is now the human rights um, and debt uh, special rapporteur. So that's one to watch. But basically countries have to come together and um, uh, you know, demand this from the rich countries. The problem, uh, the real problem is, is that the US and the EU, the hard currencies are so dominant, right? No, the, 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 the ATM for international trade is just not large enough to deal with, uh, uh, you know, the trades that are carried out. So for example, 70% of international transactions are in US dollars. About 28 to 29% is in the euro and 2% in the yuan. So unless you have currency swap arrangements like Asia does or Latin America is developing, um, you're not going to be able to net off the amounts owed between countries easily. You have to go via the US dollar. And as we are seeing, I mean, the US is, um, uh, is, is running a fabulous show. I mean, you've got a clown for a president running the show and completely distracting us from what Steve Mnuchin and all of them are doing. And basically that is tightening the noose on countries. That said, the US is providing support to other central banks because there's a real problem with dollar liquidity. So for favored partners, they are getting access to swap lines like Brazil and uh, other countries. 
uh, that were typically not getting access to dollars at the Fed window. So what we have is that um, developing countries are facing a reduced capacity to import as well as a reduced um, you know, inflow of hard currency that will enable them to actually buy the imports that they need. Or indeed to pay off the, any of the debt that they've accumulated. But it seems to me that in the, in the past, during the period of structural adjustment programs, there was a tendency for people to just blame the IMF and World Bank for so-called imposing these uh, policies. But in, in practice, what we have seen, I think, over the last 30 years is that, there, that our elites have a vested interest in these new liberal policies. They have accumulated huge amounts of wealth. The difference between the rich and the poor has, has, has escalated in enormous proportions in all of our uh, African countries. So, so to what extent then can we expect our leaders, our elites, to actually back a policy that would release Africa from its debts, release it from, the, from these neoliberal policies? Uh, do they not have a vested interest in its continuity? They are not affected, I would suggest. Or are they, in fact, affected by uh, the accumulated debt and the crisis, the economic crisis that is, is brewing? Oh, Firoz, I think the difficulty that we do have is that a lot of our elites are bought and paid for. Uh, in the sense that um, they can load up the public sector with debt and then they or their political parties or their cronies or themselves uh, can benefit directly from the indebtedness. So, for example, the governing party in South Africa benefited from a World Bank loan for a coal-fired power station. You know, um, so the, the, the relationship is very tight. And uh, because of the sums involved, especially for the top elite, it's almost impossible to contest because they're making so much money. And as, uh, you know, Perkins put it in his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, if you don't actually take on this debt, you know, the jackals come out for you, you know. And, um, you know, they uh, literally forced that down the throat of uh, some countries. But that uh, doesn't mean that there isn't a demand from our elites as well, because they benefit by um, loading up the debt. So um, there is a challenge. However, I think that with the development of national capital or national interests or regional interests, it might be possible for us to, uh, for example, in the health sector, link the interests of the elites um, uh, with uh, local production of health products and um, high-tech health goods and R&D. Uh, all this funding in the budget does not need to necessarily go to imports, although you have vested interests in imports. So if you want to put local production, for example, you've got to deal with the import vested interests and you want to try and marry them. Uh, look, um, uh, you know, hope springs eternal, but I think this is an incident where um, we can say that the ability to provide, you know, adequate um, ventilators and masks and gloves and so on is a function of good governance, as much as I hate the term. And it should be part of an essential products list that all countries should produce for themselves because otherwise they will not be able to cope with this pandemic or another pandemic, because the truth of the matter is that the influenza virus is very uh, plastic. And, uh, you know, we could have another pandemic or other waves of this uh, virus mutating. So um, there is a chance, and this is what we have to offer our elites, and people have to demand this, that we need local production of especially health products and also food as well as a social security system. These are just essential if you are to deal with the threats that um, uh, are facing us just from the health sector, let alone from other sectors. South Africa has one of the most well-organized trade union movement uh, and probably the largest one uh, uh, in, in outside of North Africa, outside Tunisia perhaps. Um, to what extent 
is there uh, organizing happening within the trade union movement? Because presumably it is their members who are also suffering as well as those who are unemployed and so on. Uh, how much pressure do you think will come from them to make adjustments in South Africa? Um, at present, there's a lot of pressure uh, because the country was in a crisis before. Uh, the previous president was rather kleptomaniac and put a lot of the state-owned enterprises into uh, uh, financial problems. And um, South Africa at that time, and as well as now, is pursuing austerity, meaning uh, they're not pursuing an expansionary budget um, uh, you know, expansionary budget uh, spending. Uh, they're actually um, restricting spending. So for COSATU, uh, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, the main union affiliated to the governing party, they have been putting pressure such as, um, you know, uh, restricting the government's uh, ability to go to the IMF for a loan and saying that we should look for other solutions or unconditional loans. I think the debate is getting a little more sophisticated now. Uh, of course, there should be no problem for us taking our allocations or special drawing rights. That is the money we've invested, money or tokens we've invested with the IMF so as to help us. And these are condition free. Uh, but I think the trade union movement across Africa in general uh, has been compromised because uh, of um, the uh, precariousness of employment. So trade unions and trades unions are not able to assert and fight against austerity that has basically been imposed on Africa uh, since the global financial crisis, whether countries are you know highly indebted or not. Uh, the issue of a, you know a labor aristocracy cannot be excluded in the sense that um, the leaders in charge make the necessary decisions and serve up their members. Uh, the trouble is, is that if they keep continue doing this, they're going to be wiped out. So, for example, Kosatu faces an existential crisis because government here is now reneging on pay increases that were increased in the uh, that were agreed to in the past, and is also talking about retrenchments in the public service, uh, and that is where most of Kosatu's members are. So, I think the contradictions are going to rise, and I think Kosatu and the unions will have to be responsive to their members because this crisis is just of enormous proportions. But as I said before, you know, these are functions of power. We have seen many times in South Africa where the actual, where the actual, um, you know, problem that we face hasn't been met with a rational response. So assumptions of rationality should not, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, we shouldn't expect those kind of responses. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, so what way out of this crisis? Uh, you're talking about the need for investment in production of basic health uh, uh, materials, equipment, and so on. But where's the investment going to come from? Um, I think that they uh, need global cooperation. For example, the way um, Venezuela exchanged oil for uh, health workers and health skills and health products. Uh, is something we can do. You know, these are non-market transactions, and perhaps um, uh, you know they 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 can be pursued in different ways, even if finance is a problem. And they are. Uh, I mean, there's been enormous shows uh, showing of goodwill from China to the African continent, as well as for the U by the U.S. to, for example, South Africa and Kenya, or you know, its usual suspects. So there is some variable. Um, there is some variable generosity. Uh, the, the, the central question under the time of the virus is, um, will we get a vaccine or a therapeutic, a medicine to treat the disease, you know, if not uh, you know, prevent its spread? Will we get it in time? Will we get enough of it? This is the central question. And from that question, we can then pursue the other e issues of uh, local production. It's absolutely necessary. African countries, are going to have to wait for a vaccine if there is one. Right now, or you know, a few months ago, the estimate was that there are vaccine production capability of 600 million doses uh, per annum. 
So it'll be a good four or five years before African countries get a vaccine if one is actually invented or, you know, created and safely tested. So this is the key problem. Now, when we look at it from an investment point of view, what we must look at it rather as an infrastructural point of view, because when we look at it at an investment point of view, the normal application is of return of investment uh, analysis. And when countries asked for production capabilities for medicines, for machines, and for vaccines previously, for example, Indonesia asked for it during the Asian flu, avian flu, flu crisis, and they were told no because it doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't make sense because the amount of money you invest in and then how much money can you make of, uh, out of it, you know, outside of the crisis, um, you know, matters. But actually, it doesn't matter. There are, you know, a few different types of technologies you need for producing vaccines and African countries should uh, make sure they collaborate so that they have the productive capacity in the continent distributed on a regional basis so that we can actually make the vaccine if it comes out or make uh, the medicine. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have to wait in a queue and that means, um, you know, four or five years before we get anything. Uh, we face a number of impediments on that. Number one is the financial resources, but um, uh, these are not uh, very high tech stuff. They're not easy to do and you have to get them 100% right. You don't want faulty vaccines or faulty medicines going out. But there are countries that are willing to uh, engage in the sharing of know-how, sharing of um, capital goods and you know machines and processes. Uh, so we should take advantage of that. The real problem, however, is that COVID-19 is looking to play out even worse than the HIV AIDS pandemic. When the HIV pandemic was uh, really heating up and there were uh, medicines for treatment for it, uh, I mean, at one stage, I can't remember the year, but it was $13,000 for a treatment. And this is what countries were forced to pay. Um, countries had legal rights to copy these medicines for public health needs, not to make a profit. And they were prevented from doing so. In fact, uh, the U.S. pharmaceutical, the International Pharmaceutical uh, Association, uh, you know, had a case. It was uh, Big Pharma versus Mandela, and um, South Africa withdrew its case uh, on the promise of aid. And we got PEPFAR and all those types of help. Uh, and we haven't issued compulsory licenses. And now that aid is drying up. And we don't have the capability for producing these medicines, although it is improving. So the issue is, do we take a response that increases our dependency or do we take a response that reduces our dependency? And um, I'm afraid that um, at the geopolitical level, what has happened is that there was supposed to be a meeting or coordination um, at the World Health Organization. And what happened was uh, instead of um, a member state, that means all countries coming together and voting and discussing what should be done about COVID-19 at the World Health Organization, the treacherous Europeans, and I have to say that because they've, they've always been uh, willing to play good cop, bad cop, and then kick us in the teeth when it comes to health. And um, the Europeans, and particularly the Scandinavians, together with the Gates Foundation, launched an initiative called the ACT Accelerator. So basically what they did was they pledged money for an institution that will provide vaccines and medicines and do the research on COVID-19. And they've taken 7.4 billion of the aid money into their governance structure and WHO uh, is a part of it, but not a lead player. So basically what you've had is the privatization of the response um, for coordinating research, coordinating vaccine development, coordinating technology transfer. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, it's like they've actually learned from um, civil society's response to the HIV pandemic. And they said, look, we've got to look like we've been, we're doing something. And uh, the most important thing is that um, the rich countries got to control the uh, aid money and control the process. So it's been taken out of the World Health Organization, even though there are 
processes now by developing countries to actually um, uh, make sure that there is some centralized con uh, centralized coordination by the World Health Organization. The U.S. at least, you know, uh, is um, rather frank. You know, they don't like the WHO. They think they banned it to China and they've pulled up their money. At least they are straight. The Europeans came in there. They're playing the cooperative game. Meanwhile, they're taking the resources and the money and putting it into philanthropic and governance mechanisms that they control. And this is uh, completely unacceptable. It, what it shows is that, um, you know, they have not really appreciated the enormity of this crisis and also that it's business as usual. This is just another money-making situation. Uh, it's it's unbelievable what has happened and you know you hardly get any coverage of this you know I mean there are few outfits that report on this uh, you know um, knowledge ecology international third world network uh, health gap uh, public citizen but these are few and far between but basically there's been a coup d'etat on the response for uh, COVID-19 and what uh, I mean, we need to focus on what we want from WHO and how the South can use the World Health Organization resources to, uh, you know, set up a shopping list and a to-do list that meets our needs instead of playing these stupid uh, northern games. I mean, it's crazy because they play these games knowing that uh, the coronavirus uh, can mutate. I mean, the Spanish flu... Uh, the initial um, flu was not so bad. The second wave was um, uh, remarkably fatal. And I mean, you know, it's just business as usual. And they've, I mean, I think it's not a postmodern North or postmodern um, West. You know, it's a post reason West. And, uh, you know, developing countries have to really come together. Yeah. <clears throat> um... You've not mentioned the Africa Union. What's its position on this whole issue of dealing with COVID? I mean, we're talking about an alliance of African states. Uh, what's been their response? Um, the Africa Group, um, I, I must say, I, the Africa Union, I haven't focused on um, what they've been doing, uh, particularly because I've been focusing on the um, WHO Afro office. But I do know that there is a uh, uh, there has been a demand from African finance ministers for um, debt moratorium as well as a debt cancellation. So that is very good. It's very nice to have statements because uh, aside from our elites uh, being bought and paid for, they also make fabulous speeches. You know, some of the speeches are as fine as Sankara's, you know, but they don't do anything. So it's all the rhetoric that's coming out, but they haven't been able to club together and make uh, very clear demands because it is possible for countries to be played off one another. Uh, but I do think that the UN Economic Commission for Africa is pushing good responses, uh, is pushing good agendas at the Africa Union. We just have to see it come through. The current fight, however, is at the World Health Organization with the Africa Group, which is that is not necessarily an AU position. The AU is receiving a lot of information and inputs and is sifting through them and trying to influence the Africa group at the World Health Organization. Uh, the World Health Organization meets virtually on the 17th and 18th to discuss a European resolution on responding to uh, the crisis. And uh, they make absolutely no mention of the provision of resources uh, for uh, new resources for fighting COVID-19. And I think the Africa group is getting um, uh, more strenuous on this at the World Health Assembly and the Africa Union will have to see after the deliberations this week what comes out from a, as an Africa Union position. So that is expected, but um, the Africa group position um, needs to be strengthened uh, basically because there needs to be more resources for uh, fighting COVID-19 under democratic control. This basically we're talking about democratic control of a science and technology instead of, uh, you know, corporate interests or, you know, um, business interests uh, and countries that just want to protect their firms. Um, the, 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 
proposals if i may go into what um, you know what you know what are we actually looking for right so on debt and finance what we're talking about is um you know uh an approach to cancel the debt and restructure uh, the debt so that there is a fair balance between the burdens on creditors and debtors then we want an international debt restructuring uh, mechanism for developing countries that can go through it so that you can see that countries aren't just taking the creditors for a ride, but also not imposing a burden on the people of the country so that they can actually respond. Then on the health issues, what we need is we need the World Health Organization to coordinate two things. One, open manufacturing. Open manufacturing is like open source and open, in, you know, uh, that kind of thing where we share designs, blueprints, specifications and, uh, you know, machines, technology, even finance for producing essential health products. We need the WHO to establish a list and uh, also a panel of experts so that we can have open manufacturing for products that do exist. This... Um, production will need to be protected. So for example, it needs to be protected from um, cheap imports, right? Because when we need these products, we can't get it. The US just seizes products or prevents countries from getting it. Uh, and the rich countries can pay a higher price. So we're last in the line waiting for donations. Um, so we need open manufacturing so that countries can produce locally, but also protect those investments that are being done now so that um, we can meet our local needs. And this is where local elites and, uh, you know, public health needs can uh, meet in a virtuous cycle. It doesn't have to be produced in the private sector. It can be produced in the public sector. Uh, but this is what we actually need and we need to protect it and the au here is very bad because the au is basically in coded language calling for further liberalization uh, across the african continent uh, under the african uh, continental free trade agreement instead of taking time to rethink uh, what the future looks like or what our needs are they just want to pursue further liberalization uh, and we know that doesn't ma really matter in a crisis because countries just block the export of goods. So, for example, South Africa blocked exports uh, to the region who, uh, like Botswana and Namibia of hand sanitizers, gloves and other things. And this doesn't bode well. So the AU is pushing for liberalization, uh, including of health products, whereas what we need now is investment to meet local needs and protection. Um, then the second thing that we need is for products that don't exist, either don't exist in the world or don't exist locally. So don't exist in the world is medicines or treatments for COVID-19 or vaccines. This needs an open innovation model uh, where we actually need to put money into R&D and mimic uh, some type of peer-to-peer -peer production. Although it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, it's basically knowledge sharing, filling in knowledge gaps and basically, you know, creating shoulders so that we can stand on them so that we can see far, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. But we got to create the shoulders rather than anything else first. So we got to have open innovation for products that do not exist. But then we also need open innovation to copy medicines like remsidivir. I don't know if I got the pronunciation right. Yeah. Um, uh, that are new treatments that are showing some potential. Right. And we should be able to copy them and make them locally. And, you know, the whole thing is, is it must be regional because what happens if the major factory in India gets contaminated by COVID-19 and can't produce or there's a massive surge and you need increased production um, of medicine so that we can help a country like Brazil or the U.S. So we need a redundancy in our productive capacity in manufacturing and of medicines. We don't need this just in time or highly optimized um, uh, health R&D or health production systems. And this is most important. And this is what we need to get out of the World Health Organization. So it's distributed productive capacity so that we don't wait in the queue for medicines, treatments or vaccines, as well as distributed R&D. 
The most important thing about distributed R&D is that Gates and the EU and all of them think that, you know, you can put money in one side and you get innovation the other side. Whereas Dr. Fauci, you know, Trump's favorite uh, epidemiologist, uh, he says that, listen, we may not even get a vaccine because some of the vaccines for SARS-CoV-1 increase the pathogenesis of uh, people. That means you took a vaccine against SARS-1, uh, SARS-CoV-1, and it increased your likelihood of contracting SARS-CoV-1. So this is a complex problem that we have, right? So what we need is we need all hands on deck. We need maximum effort because directed innovation may not give you what you want. We may get a discovery, right, that is purely accidental. And because of the severity of the virus, we need to have as many spaces and places doing R&D. The approach of the rich countries by thinking it's business as usual, they can make money from it, shows that they really don't understand the problem or uh, that uh, their elites or their governments are also captured by Big Pharma or by other interests. But South Africa has an industrial capacity to produce all kinds of things. And uh, I just wonder whether, given the emergency, is there not a case for the taking over of particular factories to produce socially needed products? Um, uh, there certainly is a case, but right now we are discussing lifting the lockdown because our lockdown is a lockdown plus a famine courtesy of austerity, you know, restricted monetary policy. So it's a lockdown plus a famine. So there is a case to be made for it, but we're talking about lifting lockdown restrictions, right, without any serious discussion around preparedness. Uh, so the epidemiological response is very good, but the public health and the socioeconomic is uh, not very good uh, because government is not even anticipating that it will have to bail out the private hospitals here in addition to all the other costs because what has happened is it's told it's very large private hospital sector that they cannot do um, uh, elective surgeries um, you know, and procedures. So you've got um, hospitals that are currently private hospitals that are making losses. You've got public hospitals that are overstrained. And the discussion is not even there. There has been some, um, some initiatives for local production, and that has been very good. But like the Europeans and Americans, they simply don't understand the scale of the problem. You know, it's like we, um, uh, we're doing a little bit to show what, that we're doing something without really uh, meeting the need or the demand um, that uh, we anticipate in this pandemic or the next. Uh, so a case has been made for nationalizations of the hospitals, but I don't think that will come through. What you have is a very powerful um, uh, set of interests in South Africa, uh, you know, led by old capital in this country, you know, the old Cecil John Rhodes capital and all those kinds of folk playing a very direct role in the decision making on this. And uh, there have been, I mean, even basic requests for food provision or income support to people have fallen on deaf ears um, because they want to keep their credit, they want to keep the credit good and they don't want to spend. Um, and I think the situation will mirror across other countries. But I must say that the epidemiological response from South Africa has been very good. Uh, and I've been surprised by it myself. So. When you talk about Gates, the pharmaceuticals, you talk about these venture funds like Ventura, which Bill Gates has major shares in, uh, then uh, we're looking at uh, a situation in which private capital is going to take advantage of uh, the, the fragility of the African economies to make a fast buck. Uh, do you see this now as a sort of a process of a greater colonization, some would say recolonization, but an extension of colonization of the continent. Uh, yes, I mean, as far as I see what Gates has done with WHO, instead of strengthening the World Health Organization, he took it totally into private control. 
uh, when you look at the response on debt relief or debt cancellation for countries, um, I mean, it's hardly there. You know, countries have to request it and we have to shine our begging bowls. So I think the um, uh, it, it's, it's definitely a chance for recolonization, uh, much to the contrary to a lot of people who are saying that this changes everything. I think um, this changes nothing as far as what we have seen. They're carrying on as business as usual. I think the lead motive for this particular experience for African countries is that the North always has more capability for cruelty. And this is what we're seeing. This is absolutely cruel to force countries to impose lockdowns, not force countries, but you know, I mean, this is the reality of the situations in conditions that will promote famine. I mean, this is like a medieval response, you know, let it rip or let it wash through as Boris Johnson was saying, uh, you know, I mean, why aren't we able to protect our people? You know, uh, you have a department of education because you need schools, you have a department of health because you need hospitals, you have a central bank because private banks go bust and carry on with a lot of shenanigans so you need to regulate them if you've got a pandemic why don't we have a pandemic institution you know it's almost like people must serve the economy uh, and you know it's um, it's really uh, very worrying the extent to which market orientated thinking has taken over our lives I mean what happened to the virtue of the um, nominally self-sufficient household I mean, we've become so uh, used to specialization and trading and depending on so many other people that we can't even respond to a crisis. In medieval times, a castle door or, you know, gates could be shut, you know, visitors kept away and you would just contain the virus there, you know. And of course, that time they were traveling at 30 miles per day, right? Now we've got far more transport, far more connectivity. And uh, so wh what we have is that our thinking has become very market orientated. I mean, um, you know, and people say things like, well, it's not so bad. More people die from drownings or from, you know, tobacco. The trouble is, is that your mortality rate increases um, when your health system capacity is reached. And I mean, Milan reached that capacity. New York City, I mean, um, uh, you know, China reached it and they have huge capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, 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 it's so inhumane the way we're responding to this. And um, the rich countries, I think, um, the, uh, the, the rich countries are going to press their advantage to squeeze whatever they want out of developing countries. And I think the, the current lot, uh, the regime in Washington, really just wants to assert their power. And we're going to have to be very, very careful about how we play this. We're going to have to play it collectively. Yeah, it's very hard to not to conclude that there is an almost an, a eugenic policy uh, being implemented with, with people who are no longer of concern to them dying. The irony of this uh, is that, you know, we, we had an interview with uh, um, uh, the author of uh, Big Farms Make Big Flu, Rob Wallace. And, and he makes the point that the that the, these kind of viruses that we've seen happening, SARS, uh, Ebola, and so on, happening over the last few years is a direct result of the deforestation associated with large-scale industrial agriculture and large-scale industrial uh, livestock production. And it is precisely in those areas that people like Bill Gates are one of the greatest proponents of the deforestation and the industrial agriculture for them to then now take advantage of it at the WHO and just uh, commercialize it seems to me something nothing short of uh, outrageous. But let me stop my uh, yeah, rant. I mean, uh, no, no, I fully agree with you and please uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think Rob Wallace does amazing work. Um, it's not only the pressure we put on, you know, taking um, uh, land, new land, you know, for under agricultural cultivation. Rob is also very strong on the negative selection that happens when you have industrial uh, meat farming. You know, you keep giving antibiotics and pathogens mutate. Uh, you know, it's... Um, 
uh, it, it's strange that we think about, we talk about reservoir species, is it bats or pangolins, and did it come out of a uh, wet market, or did it come out of a bio lab, when, you know, any poultry or any um, industrial uh, industrial farm, right, could be where this pathogen comes from. I mean, that's, uh, look, everyone is hypothesizing, but let's also say that even in biosafety labs, right, to speed the species jump, they use ferrets and rats and mice because they can't keep splicing. It's very uh, difficult to keep splicing to see what combination gives you the species jump. So we're never going to know. And there's all these conspiracy theories and everyone's playing it on WhatsApp and this Gates is getting a digital ID and all that. Uh, you know, and I'm so concerned that people don't know whether they're going to be first or last in the queue for a vaccine. You know, like, where's our, uh, uh, and I think, so I, I mean, on Rob Wallace and all of them, I think some of his followers rather than he, I think we need to be very, very realistic, right? That this, the, 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 the powers that be are doubling down. Fossil fuel industry is getting bailed out. Dirty coal is getting bailed out. Big pharma is getting support, right? It's all the cronies that are getting looked after and everyone else is fed to the wolves. This is not a time for change, right? That said, I'm not saying that coronavirus won't bring change, right? But the forces that be will change everything to keep things the same. I mean, the Federal Reserve is buying, going to buy junk bonds, right? They rated junk by ratings agencies because you're not sure you're going to get your money back. But if the Fed is buying them, they become credit uh, rated triple A. Right? You know, there's all these perversions that are happening. I mean, Gates is saving the world with his vaccine by taking science and technology away from democratic control, away from those who need it, who can have an input in it. So this is an age of massive perversion. It's not even shock doctrine. I think I think this is like shock doctrine squared. You know, they're really going to go for it. Uh, it. And I think the Fed is at least a little more reasonable than the political administrations, although the European Central Bank is just daft. I mean, they're um, imposing costs on countries and keeping the fiscal deficits and not letting uh, fiscal deficit limits and not giving support to countries. I mean, it just shows that even the North is, uh, the North is captured by market thinking and neoliberal uh, plutocracies. Well, Riaz, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Uh, I've learned so much, and I'm sure many people watching this will really appreciate what you've uh, uh, been able to help us understand. Um, I understand that you are doing some work with Equinet Africa um, to uh, produce uh, some materials around this whole issue of the health sector and the needs of that. Could you? Would you like to say a little bit about that? Uh, yes, so Equinet, along with the Eastern, Central, Southern African um, uh, health communities, uh, is basically um, producing credible, reliable information that holds a perspective that African people need to take care of themselves. Uh, the basis of this is not that we're against anyone, it's just that we want health equity for all Africans. And um, we've produced a number of briefs. The latest brief is on how we get open manufacturing and open innovation going. And we hope people can look at that so that we can influence the negotiations in um, uh, Geneva at the World Health Assembly, as well as, you know, knock gates and get BRICS and IPSA and all these development banks um, to use this as an opportunity to look after ourselves. Well, it's been great. I, I know I could spend the, the better part of the day talking further with you, but uh, I think you are also quite late at night. You've been fasting. You have to get up early tomorrow. Uh, so I want to thank you very much, Riaz, for uh, giving us time to be on this show. It's been really enlightening, really stimulating. Thank you. No, thank you for the opportunity, Feroz. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, go well, and uh, I hope to be in touch again soon. Okay, take care. Thank you. Send the link, yeah? I will. I will. That was Riaz Tayob from Siatini uh, in South Africa. Um, 
goodness, what a lot of thinking he's doing. Uh, I think I was really, really, a, a, a really most interesting uh, perspective from him. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Organizing in the Time of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is Firoz Manji from Daraja Press signing off for today.